Well, thank you. Yeah, I am Joe Bast. I'm the president of the Heartland Institute. In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the history of Heartland, our mission, our programs, and how we hope that you will all get involved in the organization. We were downtown Chicago for 31 years, and we just moved out here about a year ago. That's uh, Mayor Thomas Hayes uh, clipping the ribbon for the grand opening of our building. Heartland was started in 1984. I was uh, the co-founder. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. We're devoted to discovering, developing, and promoting free market solutions to social and economic problems. Right off the bat, there's a few things you should know that we're not. So we're not a political party. We're not here to try to persuade you to vote for Hillary Clinton. We're not a religious group. Uh, we're not a cult. There's no cult figures in the room. Uh, we're not a front group. If you look at our Wikipedia site and other uh, places online, you'll see allegations that we're representing everybody from Comcast to Exxon to uh, drug companies. Uh, we're not any of that. We're a freestanding, independent research organization. And finally, we're not a spa and we're not a restaurant. Uh, those of you who might be familiar with the Chicago area, there's a great spa. There's good restaurants. There's also busing companies and trucking companies and insurance companies and investment companies that all call themselves Heartland. We are not affiliated with any of those. This is the guy who started the Heartland Institute in 1984, Dave Padden. Dave Padden was a wonderful guy. Uh, he was the father of seven, the grandfather of 15. He was married for 61 years to Joan. Just a wonderful guy. Uh, he was uh, the founder is uh, for the first 10 years, he was the chairman of the Heartland Institute. He served on our board of directors until 2011 when he passed away, uh, I think at the age of 83. Um, Dave hired me as the first employee of the Heartland Institute. So that's me and Dave meeting back in 1984. I had shaved my beard to apply for the job and interview. And then as soon as I got it, I shaved it back off. Dave Padden was an idealist, okay? He, he had one passionate idea, and that was freedom. He believed that a society that's based on freedom would be a prosperous, peaceful, and just society, that freedom could be the organizing principle for a civilization, for a society. Dave felt that the opposite of this was a society based on tyranny or force, and in our our age and our era, government is the main instrument of coercion and force. Government is the institution that has a monopoly on the legal use of force. Okay, so Dave saw the world as a choice. Either you're in favor of a free society or you're in favor of one that's based on coercion. Dave liked to point out that man's natural condition is not freedom. This is not something that that we're just born into or that history has given to us as this great gift. In fact, if you look at human history, it's almost entirely slavery and tyranny. Okay, that was the natural state of man. If you look at the Roman Empire, all the great civilizations in the past, you see a lot of slavery, a lot of coercion, a lot of tyranny, a lot of kings, a lot of uh, emperors. You don't see a whole lot of individual freedom. That finally started to change around 1750. This is a graph of world GDP from 500 BC to 2000 AD. They took some liberties in creating this graph, I'm sure, but it shows that something happened around 1750. So after almost 100 generations of human beings not improving their status, for 100 generations, people pretty much lived the way that their parents did and their grandparents and their great-grandparents and the and those before that. They even used the same technology. Um, when uh, a great example of this in Russia, at the time of the Russian Revolution, you had peasants who were using tools in the fields that were literally from the Bronze Age. Okay, there had been no technological progress for 10, 15 generations in a country like that. So after centuries of no economic progress, something happened in 1750. All of a sudden, wealth started to go up. It's like a hockey stick. Uh, if you look at health, you'll see health improved dramatically. Human longevity 
Same thing, right around 1750, you see this big uh, sudden increase in human uh, prosperity. So what happened? Three things happened. The first thing was a cultural change. The idea of freedom moved from the periphery, from a value that very few people embraced, and that was actually discouraged by all of the leaders. Freedom became a more popularly accepted and embraced value. Um, a lot of the thought behind that came out of what's called the Scottish Enlightenment. And in your studies, if you have a chance, read some of these guys. Francis Hutcheson, um, Adam Ferguson, David Hume, and of course Adam Smith. These are scholars working in Scotland back in the 1700s who were grappling with what they were seeing around them, the birth of capitalism, the birth of new technologies, and a moral system that didn't seem to be consonant with that new development. Uh, you had a moral system that was still heavily dependent on religious faith, that was still collectivist instead of individualist, that discouraged people from going out and doing their own thing, from being individuals. Okay. So they saw a disconnect and they said, can we develop a theory, a moral theory, a theory of ethics that reconciles capitalism uh, with, with our values? And I think they came together and they, they accomplished that. A second thing was happening at the same time, and that was the emergence of markets. Markets are places where people come together and trade goods and services. In a marketplace, you can bring all your potatoes and sell them and get clothes or, or transportation or other types of food. If you don't have markets, you've got to grow all that stuff yourself. You've got to make your own clothes, so you can't specialize. Markets allow people to specialize. And when you start to specialize, your productivity increases. You get really good at making potatoes because you're not spending your time trying to weave clothing every evening. Okay? And the guy who spends all of his time weaving clothing comes up with better and better ways to produce clothes. So we become wealthier because we're able to trade with other people. We're able to exchange goods and services. We're able to specialize. Now, markets require certain institutions. If you don't have property rights, you can't have markets. You can't sell what you don't own. Okay? So the rise of markets required that we start to identify and define and protect private property rights. Contracts. You can't have markets if people don't keep the promises that they make. So you need to develop institutions that know how to write and interpret and enforce contracts. All of this now goes under the label the rule of law. You need to have the rule of law in order to have viable markets. And that all started happening in England and Scotland right around the 1750s. The third institutional change was a technological change, fossil fuels. All of a sudden, we were able to have steam-powered tractors that could do the work of 100 people. Was I one slide ahead? There we go, fossil fuels. Um, so we had tractors that could do the work of 100 people. Uh, we had cars, trucks, and then planes that were able to travel huge distances. When you get that sort of technological innovation, the division of labor kicks in big time. So now you've got one guy who can raise enough food to feed the entire village. Okay? You've got one guy making nails. You've got one guy making needles. And you've got that specialization that allows high quality and very low costs. When you get transportation, like cars and trucks and ships and airplanes, markets can become tremendous. You're no longer just selling to the guy across the road, the guy down the road, the next village over. You're now selling to people who are hundreds of miles away, maybe all the way around the world. And that, again, just rewards specialization, division of labor, and productivity. So you get a tremendous boost in wealth caused by the technologies that are made possible by fossil fuels. All right, the Founding Fathers saw this. Okay, this is right, 1750, 1760, 1770. Our Founding Fathers are living in a world that's being transformed by fossil fuels, by markets, and by this new philosophy of individual rights and individual liberty. They were communicating with the people in England all the time. Our Founding Fathers were intellectuals. They had great libraries. Thomas Jefferson had this wonderful library. Um, you had Benjamin Franklin, who was corresponding with Adam Smith. Adam Smith would write to him and say, what's going on in this new world? And is this, are we seeing the rise of a free society for the first time in human history? 
a society based on the principles of freedom and free enterprise. And uh, Benjamin Franklin would write back saying, yes, we're seeing it here. It's working. This could become a model for all of Europe to transform itself. So the Founding Fathers put these ideas into the Declaration of Independence, the first great document for the founding of America, and they were revolutionary. There had never been a war declared, a war of independence, based on the idea that people had individual rights. So we hold these truths to be self-evident, a radical claim. Most people in the world didn't believe they were self-evident at the time. That all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That was historically unprecedented. It was the first time in history that a war was declared based on principles that had to do with individual rights and liberty. They put it in the Constitution. Okay, so after the Civil War, we get the Constitution of the United States. For the first time, you get a founding document for a nation that puts these things right up at the top. We, the people of the United States, not the government, not a particular class, not a particular king, not a family, not a religion. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. In other words, this is a contract with a purpose to create a union. Okay, not to separate up, out power or divvy up uh, the spoils of war, but to actually create a union to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense. You know all of this. So we become the first country in the history of the planet that's based on this idea of individual freedom and that governments exist not to take wealth from us or redistribute wealth, but to actually protect us, to create a more perfect union devoted to justice. So it worked pretty well. America became a beacon for the rest of the world. I mean, we had millions and millions of people coming from all around the world in order to, ex uh, to, to become part of this great experiment of freedom. Uh, we became that shining hill on or that shining city on the hill that was a model for other countries. And once America existed, other countries couldn't exercise tyranny over their people, or at least not easily, because people could vote with their feet. They could come to America where freedom was respected and where they actually had an opportunity to become free and prosperous. Now, in recent times, Ronald Reagan was probably the best spokesperson for these ideas in American politics. Okay? You don't have to be partisan about this. I, didn't, I never voted for this guy, actually. So... But what a wonderful spokesperson for these ideas. I think Ronald Reagan truly understood it. He was one of those rare politicians who ran because he saw the country was going in the wrong direction. He wanted to steer it back to original American principles. He saw the purpose of government wasn't to satisfy every need or to make the buses run on time uh, you know, or, or to, to achieve any of these other goals. It was actually strictly limited to protecting life, liberty, and property. So we had a president of the United States as recently as 1980, 1984, the two elections, um, who actually understood what America was about and what the proper role of a president was. One of Reagan's most famous lines is, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It must be fought for, protected, and handed to our children for them to do the same. It's a critical point, and I make it every day in my job here at the Heartland Institute. I talk to donors, and they say, well, you know, I'm so upset with politics, and I'm just going to sit out this term, or I can't do anything about it. And I try to emphasize to them, no, actually, you have a unique duty and responsibility to keep liberty alive for one more generation. It really is our responsibility. It's your job. You can't sit on the sidelines. You can't enjoy the fruits of freedom and then expect somebody else to defend it. Okay? It doesn't work that way. You've got to stand up defend it yourself. Because if you don't, okay, we lose it. In a single generation, in 30 years, freedom can be lost. We've seen that in other countries. If you look at Latin America, you're seeing that today. Um, and so there's, there's a lot at stake. You can't take freedom for granted. So you got to create organizations like the Heartland Institute. You need organizations whose mission is to keep freedom alive, to pass it from generation to generation. 
So who are we? We're about 6,000 donors, men and women just like you, just like your parents, just like your neighbors, who make voluntary contributions to fund our budget. We have a full-time staff of 39 people. We have 250 policy advisors. These are usually professors at universities all across the country. We have 200 elected officials who actually pay dues to be on what we call the Legislative Forum, uh, a membership organization for elected officials so that they can give us advice and we can give them uh, priority attention to their uh, interests and concerns. And finally, we have 30 senior fellows, uh, folks who speak for us, who testify, who write, who participate in our peer review processes. Here's what we do. We produce books. We produce big books. We produce 1,000-page books that are like telephone directories on climate change. We've done four of those so far, and a fifth one is in the pipeline. We also produce little books. I thought I had. There we go, little books like this one on climate change. We've printed 195,000 copies of this book, and we're in the process of mailing them to every uh, science teacher in every K-12 school in the United States and to every professor of physical sciences in the United States. I mean, that's huge. That's enough people to actually change public opinion and change the debate. We also produce public policy newspapers, and these are pretty unique. We are the only think tank that came up with this idea. So budget and tax news. So if you're a busy elected official or a civic or business leader, you don't have a lot of time to read policy studies about Social Security reform, okay? But you do have time to read newspapers, and you read them every morning, and you throw them out when you're done. So we said, why not take the best research and commentary on free market solutions to public policy problems and format them like newspaper articles? Create our own little tabloid-sized newspaper like the Chicago Sun-Times, for, for those of you who would have seen that. And it looks just like a newspaper, reads just like a newspaper, short articles, lots of bylines, lots of pictures, and it's not a coincidence. We want elected officials especially to, to become accustomed to receiving these newspapers, read them in 10 or 15 minutes, throw them away, and it gives them an idea of what's going on around the country on free market ideas being applied to solve state and national public policy problems. So we do budget and tax news, environment and climate news, healthcare news, and school reform news. Each one comes out once a month, which means every week, every national and state elected official in the United States, it's about 8,500 people, are getting one of these publications. Okay? So every elected official in the country at the national and state level, they know who we are. We do telephone surveys. 85% of them say that they read at least one of these publications, either sometimes or always. So it's a great way to get the attention of elected officials to put your ideas in a format, like a newspaper, that they're comfortable with and that they're likely to read. We also produce videos. If you go on our website, you'll see hundreds of videos from our past conferences and other efforts. We host lots of events. Uh, we've been holding one or two events a week in this space here. Um, so we try to get our message out that way. We're very active online. Not surprise, no surprise to anybody here, but we have lots of websites, lots of web pages. We produce podcasts that get listened to hundreds of thousands of times um, every quarter. Uh, we focus on the effective marketing of other people's work. One of our themes here is uh, we don't believe in not invented here. If Cato Institute or Heritage Foundation or American Enterprise Institute produce a high quality publication, we want to be the ones who take that and bring it to the attention of elected officials and other opinion leaders. Okay? If we can't match the quality of our peer organizations, the least we can do is help market their stuff, put it in the hands of the actual policymakers. So that's part of our DNA around here. That's what we try to do. If we don't have good research, we find it and make it available to elected officials whenever they ask. We contact elected officials a lot. In fact, we contact them more than any other organization in the United States. Last year, we recorded over a million contacts with elected officials. Okay? That's phone calls and emails and letters and uh, attendance at meetings. So we end up just constantly communicating with real policymakers at the state level. You can categorize what we do 
the topics that we address into four categories. The first is taxes and budgets. We call for lower taxes and balanced budgets. We focus on climate change, the global warming scam. According to The Economist, we're the world's most prominent think tank uh, opposing global warming alarmism. Uh, we work on health care reform. We are very active attempting to uh, keep Obamacare from passing, and then once it passed, we've been on the front lines trying to get it repealed and replaced. And we work on Common Core uh, and other educational reform issues. Uh, we think uh, the most important thing we could accomplish today is improving and transforming K-12 education in the United States. So I mentioned to you last year we moved into this space. It had a big impact on us. This is a beautiful neighborhood. It's very friendly. It's 80% Republican voters, which is kind of nice compared to what we had downtown Chicago. Um, it's very safe, and I think it's a great place uh, to live and work in. Uh, there's a half a dozen ways that you can work with the Heartland Institute. You can attend future events and bring your friends. As I said, we hold lots of events in this space. You can become a volunteer or an intern. Uh, we are constantly on the lookout for interns. We've had maybe a dozen last year, and we're aiming for more than that in the coming year. You can write for us. You don't have to be in this office. You don't have to be an intern to write for us. So in the comment fields on websites or op-ed pieces or letters to the editor, we're always looking for people who can write effectively and clearly on public policy issues. You can help host or sponsor an event, maybe on campus, maybe somewhere else. We're happy to send speakers and provide logistical support. And you can become a donor. Um, there is, as I like to say, there is no limit on how much you can contribute to the Heartland Institute. So if you want to give a million dollars, two million dollars, I think we can um, find a way to accommodate your interest. <laughs> well done. All right, let me end with this. Uh, at the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned Dave Padden. Um, Dave Padden, the wonderful guy who founded the Heartland Institute, and his big idea was freedom. Okay? Everything else is details. We're all about freedom. How can you expand the amount of individual freedom in this society? How can you solve problems voluntarily instead of relying on the force of government? I think it's a great intellectual mission to try to find these voluntary solutions to problems. It's easy to say, well, let's have the government fix that. Let's have the government solve that. And we, we know it usually doesn't work. And you surrender your freedom every time you ask the government to solve a problem. So we are here to discover those solutions, okay, and then having discovered them, to effectively promote them, to get them into the hands of policymakers so that we actually make a difference, so that we're not just talking to ourselves or to each other, but we're actually out in the real world changing public policy. Uh, I think we've had great success in doing that, and I'm hoping that each of you is going to join us in the future so that we can do even more of this more effectively. Okay? Thank you very much.